Welcome on board friends. This is an isolated DC to DC converter board with three outputs based on the flyback topology. The input voltage range is quite wide from 50 to 300 volts. It has three outputs. Let me show you. These are the outputs, 5 volts, 3.3 volts, each capable of supplying 500 milliamps continuously and the third one is 15 volts which is fully isolated from the other two and regulated independently. It can provide up to 300 milliamps continuously. I don't think you will find a similar circuit like this online. Let me show you the bottom side of the board. This is the controller. You can see the isolation gaps or creepage areas. This is the shunt regulator in the feedback loop. And the two grounds are fully and completely isolated. I designed this board about a year ago for a customer, Mr. William Boardman, and he gave me permission to share it publicly. As usual, I designed a schematic and PCB using Altium Designer. I've uploaded the project files to my Altium 365 cloud space. Just follow this link in the YouTube video description and sign up on the Altium website. Then follow this link to access and download the project files. Let me explain the board just briefly because in the next step, I will explain the schematic and PCB in full details. So here is the DC input. We don't need a bridge rectifier because it is actually DC. Common mode choke, fuse, NTC, X2 rated capacitor for high frequency noise reduction. This is the main capacitor for noise reduction. This is the MOSFET to switch the primary of the transformer. These three components belong to the snubber circuit to dampen the spikes and noise of the primary of the transformer. This side goes to the auxiliary of the transformer to supply the controller. So the auxiliary winding supplies the controller after the startup process. This is the optocoupler that provides a galvanically isolated path for the controller to sense the output voltage and regulate it. But this side is not on the feedback loop and it's regulated independently. So the optocoupler does not sense this side because the ground of this side is separated from this ground. So on the output side, we see Schottky diode, inductor, and the pi filtering, this uh, multi-time potentiometer to precisely adjust the output voltage, this LED to indicate that there is a correct voltage level at the output, we have something similar for the isolated side, shot key, and uh, this DC to DC converter to uh, convert the input voltage to 15 volts. And as I said, it can deliver up to 300 milliamps continuously. And the ground of the transformer is here because it was not, I can say, I couldn't find uh, enough pins on the transformer bobbin to solder the ground, so the ground wires uh, comes out from the transformer and are soldered on the, uh, directly on the PCB. I think I covered everything just quickly. Uh, let's go to the schematic and PCB. All right, here is the home page of my Altium 365 cloud space, and this is the latest project which I will discuss. But why do I use this? What's the catch? What's in it for me? Altium 365 has many features, but one stands out. It makes teamwork easy, especially for complex PCB projects. Imagine a team where one person works on the power supply, another designs the digital circuits, and someone else handles the RF parts, such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Another team member creates the bill of materials and buys the components. And finally, one teammate prepares the component libraries. 
If you use the traditional method, I mean the email, to exchange project files and comments, things will get messy. It leads to loss of attachments, misunderstandings, errors, and frustration. This will delay your project, stress the team members, and affect the company's income and reputation. But with Altium 365, the whole team works on a secure cloud platform. Everyone can leave comments, apply edits, update component values, and more, all in one place. If you have worked on a complex PCB project, I'm sure now you feel the difference. So I won't explain more, follow this link and try it yourself. Here is the latest project. When I double click, the project documents, uh, the project documents open right away. Here is the schematic document. This one is the PCB layout. And this one is the 3D view of the PCB board. Let me start with the schematic. Before I continue, let me remind you that you can download this project for free, of course. Just follow this link in the YouTube video description and sign up on the Altium website, receive your welcome offers, and then follow this link and download the project files. Let me zoom in on the schematic since it looks a bit crowded. We will start from this edge uh, where the DC input comes in. So here is the common mod chalk for noise reduction, this fuse for protection, this NTC to limit the inrush current, these two capacitors for noise reduction, these two series resistors provide the initial startup current for the controller, this IC3. These components make up the snubber circuit, which protects the MOSFET uh, from high voltage spikes and ringing on the primary of the transformer. This is the main purpose of the snubber, but if it is designed correctly, it can also reduce the conducted emission. This MOSFET to switch the primary, of course, and this auxiliary winding, these two wires, supplies the controller after the startup process. So this D5 rectifies the voltage. This is an RC filter to reduce the noise. And this Zener diode ensures that this voltage on this line does not go higher than 24 volts because this auxiliary winding is floating. So the voltage varies by the input voltage or any changes in the output current. This C20 capacitors, capacitor is pretty important. So I placed this C19 capacitor in parallel to reduce its ESR and also to increase the lifespan because if this capacitor dries out or fails, it affects the performance of the controller or maybe even it, the controller stops working. Even you can use a solid I mean one of those aluminum solid capacitors here. They have much lower ESR and much higher current ripple, but they are of course much more expensive. So it's up to you. If the cost doesn't matter, use a solid capacitor for, for C20. This R17 sets the switching frequency, which is 65 kilohertz. Let's go to the feedback loop. So this optocoupler provides a galvanically isolated path for the controller to sense the output voltage. So it senses any changes in the output voltage and regulate it by modifying the duty cycle of the PWM. This is a simple explanation. It is much more complex than this, but briefly it works like this. It, and the controller modifies the duty cycle of the PWM by the changes in the output. I put this multi-temp potentiometer here because in the prototype you wind the transformer by hand and it would have some tolerance. So this potentiometer is to compensate that tolerances and variations. So you can set the output voltage exactly on 5 using this potentiometer. Let's go to the secondary side, nothing special here, this Schottky diode and this CLC or Pi filter for noise reduction. We get the 5 volts rail from here. And then 
uh, I prepared the regulator 3.3 volts rail from uh, I mean I provided using this linear regulator this part number because the current consumption is low is around 500 milliamps so this linear regulator is enough for this purpose and of course this LED to show that there is a correct level at the correct voltage level at the output this Y capacitor to protect the circuit and to reduce the high frequency noises and this isolated part this winding will handle 15 15 volts and 300 milliamps continuously uh, the ground of this side is uh, different from this ground so we have to uh, regulate this side independently it is not uh, on the feedback loop so that's why I use this MP4560 DC to DC converter chip I explained this chip in the previous video if you in the previous video if you follow this link so this is a typical circuit for the uh, for this chip this DC to DC converter however this R5 resistor stabilized the uh, input voltage because this winding is floating so we have to somehow uh, stabilize it using a load resistor like this the rest is not something special I think it, I covered everything isn't it if you have any questions feel free to ask in the comments let's go to the PCB so this is a two layer PCB I have followed several PCB designing techniques and rules here I explain one by one the first one is the snubber these components the snubber circuit should be placed as close as possible to the transformer like what you see here the same thing applies to the MOSFET the switching pin of the MOSFET death trace is pretty critical death trace should be wide and short because it carries fast switching high current pulses and can act like an antenna becoming a major source of radiated emission if not designed properly so be careful about this maybe this is the first rule the next one is the loop at the output side in the secondary side the loop i mean starts from the uh, positive of, of the Schottky diode here and goes to the ground pin of the first capacitor this loop should be as small as possible that's why you see in designs they put the ground pin of the capacitor really very close to the ground pin of the winding like what you see here in this side also i have followed the same rule so this loop what i mean so even the second capacitor the ground of the second capacitor is very close to the ground and this is the ground pin because as I said the ground pin uh, uh, the ground side of the winding is soldered directly on this pad this G pad so very close to the ground of the capacitor the next rule is the grounding so the ground loops should be very small and the impedance of the ground pass should be as low as possible that's what you see here so there is no loop or the loops are very small and I have even made these loops smaller using these wires let me show you the bottom side just the bottom side so you see almost a solid ground plane you see on the secondary side this is almost a solid ground plane this helps to reduce the impedance of the ground pass the results lower noise and higher performance for the power supply do the same on the primary I mean the primary side non-isolated side let me enable the layers again or you can press this the next technique is using thermal relief for the capacitors pins where it is necessary when the capacitors are close to the heat source such as these uh, inductors and Schottky diodes it's better that we use 
thermal relief for the capacitor's pins, like what I did here, because heat reduces the lifespan of the capacitors uh, because the ESR increases and the capacitor dries out too soon. That's why you see bulgy capacitors at the output of the power supplies often. So uh, I think I covered the major points. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments section. All right, here are some details about the fried core, bobbin and winding pattern. The picture on the left shows the fried core I used. It's an E25-137 type and the bobbin is a horizontal 5 plus 5 pin style. The picture on the right shows the winding pattern and the estimated gap size. The dot symbol marks the starting point of each winding that follows the primary. For example, the primary winding consists of 31 turns using a single strand of 0.5 mm magnet wire. On the secondary side, the ground wire exits the transformer and is soldered directly to the PCB. I assume you already know how to wind a transformer, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments.